Hello and welcome to Nirmal Bang, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hirul Dadia. We have with us Siddharth Sikchi, Executive Director of Clean Science and Technology, joining in. Siddharth, welcome to the show. And pleasure to have you and congratulations once again for the IPO. Uh, Siddharth, for our viewers, if you could just help us understand uh, what's the basic objective of the IPO. Thank you, Hirul. Thank you for having me over and understanding more about us and the company. So one of the major reasons for doing this IPO is, of course, with the IPO, there will be a lot of visibility to the organization, A. B, I mean, as we are growing on an accelerated path, we need good employees to join us. And with the ESOP policy which we have created, the ESOP pool we have created, I think we'll be able to get good people on board. Three, always, once you have a big visibility, both on Indian Stock Exchange, you know, when you approach new customers getting on board, you know, that confidence is far more because you are dealing with a company which is listed as good corporate governor. I mean, a lot of things come with it. And lastly, I think, uh, you know, any acquisition opportunity we generally miss by non-listed space, you know, because I have seen that people see if there is an opportunity and they go to listed space because listed space may, what happens is you know what the companies are into and, you know, who can be the best buy. So I think those opportunities will also come by if we are in listed space. So these are some of the few reasons why we have decided to list this organization. All right. Uh, Siddharth, if you could just give us more details with regards to the anchor investors. So yes, uh, we have, of course, uh, there was very, very strong demand and it was very, very difficult for me to decide the 25 anchor investors apart from, so of course it, it falls into two buckets, FIA, DIIs, and of course the Indian mutual fund. So in the mutual fund space, we have uh, all the big mutual fund names uh, like HDFC, SBI, Axis, uh, Birla, Kota, Nippon, ICICI. So these are part of mutual funds. And in um, Anchor, in FIIs, we have names like GICA, uh, White Oak, Nomura, Aberdeen, BlackRock, GSAM, Goldman Sachs, and you know, Pine Bridge, Thaleem, Think. Uh, so some of the like uh, SPI Life, Birla Life. So I think uh, these are some of the like-minded investors. Of course, there were many more which I would have loved to accommodate in my anchor, but of course the book was small and I had good names. So yeah, that's what it is. Right. Uh, oh, right. So, so that overall, if you have to see business right now, we are predominantly doing performance chemicals, pharma intermediaries, as well as FMCG chemicals, wherein our dependence on performance chemicals is the maximum in terms of revenues. Now, is this something as a trend that is expected to continue going ahead as well? Or do you think there is a possibility of a rejig happening between the revenues that come from these three segments in the next three to five years? So I'll tell you, <clears throat> See, performance chemical is a very interesting segment. It is like you know, performance chemical or sta stabilizers or additives. What are they? Is uh, these are small ingredients which are needed by these large chemical producers, you know. And once you are in the business with them, then it's a very long haul business. If you you know because it is one of the smallest item in any purchaser's list. So if you are able to supply them at a good price, uh, timely supplies you know, sustainable, you know, then these guys don't tend to move around a lot. And I think this niche which we have created over the last 15 odd years has been phenomenal in this performance business. And then what happens is once you are growing into a segment, you get more and more opportunities also related to that segment. Hmm. So going forward, also, I think performance chemical shall remain one of our very, very key areas. But of course, we are also enlarging our product portfolios, which will find further applications in pharma, agro, and even FMCG. So things would move a little bit, but I do not see that it would reverse or anything of that sort. Because I personally like this space, performance chemical is what, I think we've created a good niche. We know customers, we know distributors globally, and I think we can really harness on that. Hmm. Right, so that's with regards to, you know, performance chemicals as well, especially talking about where, you know, pharma intermediaries go, there was a lot of dependence that was happening on imported products, especially on the APIs and the intermediaries front for Indian companies. Uh, taking into consideration now that, you know, uh, there has been tightening of environmental norms in China, 
the recent trade dispute between China and the United States, has that reduced Chinese exports? And do you think the source of raw material number one has been shifting from China to India? And that could be one of the positives that could work for the pharma division as well for a company like yours? So let me tell you, you know, I, I, I get this question quite a lot that would this help us? It would help us. People will look at us at a longer term vision. A longer term view when these multinationals based out of the united states or the europe or whatever that is when they look at india of course it's a longer view but honestly today the time has been very short see the facilities which chinese have created the processes which they have optimized they have mastered over the last several several years yeah. all of a sudden if you tell any other producer to start making it it's not going to happen it's yeah. a very long process and you have to respect that whatever chinese have done over the past several years. It is not easy for Indians to just replicate in a couple of months. It's a long process and of course it's a great opportunity for Indian entrepreneurs to look at this yeah. space. But of course, uh, to be very honest, the prices which the Chinese keep offering for these products or these intermediates are so, so thin margins that you have to really work very hard at it. Right. So uh, on an average, what's the kind of price differential between Chinese products versus what we manufacture? Well, it depends on product to product, it depends on business to business. But as you can see, China is one of the largest manufacturing hub globally. You know, so of course, their products are far cheaper uh, than Indian intermediates or Indian chemical sector. But I think that difference is going away. Things are changing. Indians, I think Indian chemical industry is really working very hard. People are trying to spend more money on research and development and things will change. I mean, we are a very young company, 14, 15 year, you know, I think it is relatively a newer company in space. And despite of that, we have come up with some of the processes which we have developed first time globally. So I'm sure there will be a lot of minds now working on this space. And plus this space has, I mean, after COVID times or during the COVID times, Chemical has got a additional new flavor in town. And I think uh, a lot of emphasis is going to be, I mean, a lot of emphasis, even the government is trying to put on chemical space. Right. Uh, overall, Siddharth, you know, in terms of exports as well, I think almost 69% of the FI21 revenues came from exports. Uh, is there a possibility that we will see the share of Indian business also increase? And between exports and uh, the domestic business, what is more competitive from a business perspective? So, I would rather talk about my business. So it is not that uh, we, when I look at a product, it is, I generally look at global markets. I mean, that is how now things have become. The businesses now have started to look at overall scenario rather than looking at only Indian markets or export market. But for some odd reason, some of our products really fine. So some of my products, larger products like MEHQ, 95 or 90% of business comes out of export revenues. Whereas um, there are some other products like Wirecall, which goes into cuff syrups or it goes to pharmaceuticals, where India is about 80% and export is about 20 odd percent. So, but to be honest with you, uh, I mean, to be really honest, I find both markets have become very, very competitive. I mean, uh, the accessibility of other producers with internet, I mean, people are aware what others are doing and you have to be competitive, be, be, be it domestic market or be it export market. Okay. And overall, uh, but so do we think that our exports will continue to remain, the, the breakup between exports and domestic will continue to remain in this range or are we looking to increase Indian business as well? No, I would love to increase business in India provided the products we get into, if they have Indian application, uh, we would be more than happy to do business within India as well because we are based out of India, you know. I mean, it's always easy to do uh, business in the same region. But I, I, as I look forward, it still appears to me that, you know, we might move a little bit here and there, but, but it never would be the reverse way around where uh, domestic would be more than export. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And overall, with regards to growth as well, we've seen a CAGR of 29% between FI 18 to 21. I think it's the fastest amongst peers as well. Are we expecting this trend to continue or outperform this trend also in the coming three to four years, taking the opportunities into consideration? So I can only tell you here, of course, without making any forward looking statements that, uh, of course, we are coming up with two more units, which is known to public. I mean, there is a, so we are already having two units. Now we are coming up with unit three, 
again in Kurkum where we are trying to add additional 15 to 20,000 metric ton per annum capacities where we are trying to enlarge our product portfolio getting into newer products which will find application again in stabilizers or performance chemicals, pharma, agro. And also we are uh, increasing the capacities of our existing business lines. So it will be a mix of both. So with God's grace, if everything goes well, I mean, the growth should be sustainable. Okay. And again, on the margin front as well, we've seen spectacular growth from 30 and a half to almost 50 and a half in FY21. And I believe it's mainly the benefits of uh, the increased capacity of Anisol that has led to this kind of margin expansion. Is this something which is sustainable? See, I'll tell you, if I'm in, in, when I'm increasing the capacities of my same products line, these margins are sustainable. The reason is very simple that, see, now I make my raw material in-house, which is again with a very uh, novel catalytic technology. I also make the end product. So I have now end-to-end, -end, you know, uh, we are now fully integrated facilities have been built up. So the margin should remain when we are in the same business line. But going forward, I can only tell you that, of course, it is very difficult for any chemical company to only look at businesses where the margins are 50%. You know, of course, when we started the business also a couple of, or whatever, 2007-2009, the margins were not so high. These margins built up generally happen as your capacity ramp up happens, as you go backward integration, uh, uh, as you do backward integration, you are trying to improve your yields of your process, you try to improve efficiencies of your processes. So whenever new products come in, the margins are not that high. But if there is, uh, but if there is constant work added, which we keep doing it, constant mm -hmm. R&D added, you know, you keep improving the margins because you keep, you know, getting better process, getting better yields out of the system. And of course, the volume built up also happens. So this is how it is. Right. And then the revenue that we get, I think we have a high concentration amongst the top 10 customers as well. So do you think there is a need to further increase the customer base so that, you know, the risks of concentration to a single client reduces? So, you know, you know, this question I have heard a couple of times. So what happens is one of, one of the top customer we have is company based in China, who is our distributor in China. And he supplies to at least 20 other companies within China. If you see 35% of my revenues also come from China. So, so I'm not saying, of course, the concentration is high, but there are distributors also in those customers where they are supplying to many customers. So that is why it appears as one customer in my list, but actually it is not just one customer because it is supplying to 10 more customers Understood. in that region. So that is why it is actually a widespread. But of course, going forward as we increase our or we enlarge our product portfolios and I mean, you know, we'll be able to get new customers on board when we get into new segments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, apart from that, you are... Uh, increasing your focus with regards to R&D as well. Uh, so currently, what percentage of the revenues is R&D and by how much are we looking to increase it to? So, Hiral, today say we are spending about a percent or just less than a percent mm. of our top revenues on R&D. Going forward on absolute terms, yes, the spend on R&D will increase. We are adding additional laboratory. I mean, now we have two R&D uh, laboratories. Now we are adding third one. So, of course, the spend on R&D will increase. But on percentage basis, I do not know. But yes, on absolute terms, the spend on R&D will increase. Okay. And so that with regards to where expansion goes, uh, as we mentioned, the process of expanding the R&D infrastructure also uh, with an additional unit at Kurkum in Maharashtra. Apart from R&D expansion on the manufacturing side as well, uh, what's the kind of spends are we looking at in terms of infrastructure expansion? So infrastructure is basically when we build a plants, you know, we build, you know, the same, um, we need like admin blocks, QC labs, R&D blocks, you need warehouses, utility blocks. So these are what accounts to the capex other, and of course an EPP uh, plan. So these are the capex which happen along with your plans. But going forward, say, if we are even thinking of two to three years time frame, I think the capex could be around 300 odd crores going forward. Okay, and currently, what's our capacity utilization? I think it is about 72, 73 odd percent. And is that because of COVID or uh, has it been higher earlier? Nah, 
actually what happens is uh, what happens is when we see when you do this capacity utilization is all plants put together you know but there are some plants which have just recently begun for us like in uh, in the year uh, 2020 so those were running at lower capacities but other plants were anyways running at 80 82% capacity so nothing to do with covid a little bit you can say there were delays in shipment but in covid year also we grew our top line by 25 watt percent hmm. okay and so that let's talk about a couple of risks because we've just spoken about all the positive so far a uh, one risk that comes up is that none of the company's catalytic uh, processes are patented uh, do you think that's something that in future somewhere could hamper business taking into consideration that the processes could be imitated uh, say by peers so you know what is the point is we have got a lot of um, discussion over this catalytic patenting hmm. technology But क्या होता है when you have to patent a technology in a box, you have to really divulge a lot of lot of your uh, information. You have to prove to the patent authority or the patent uh, guy that that why are you different. To do that, you have to keep giving a lot of finer details which you have developed. You know. But then what happens is once this patent is out, great, you've got a patent. But the deal is, do I have the control to see who is using that patent? suppose tomorrow just hypothetically a company in china or some part of china or some part of taiwan or korea uses this technology or uses bits and parts of my patent then and works on our technology and establishes a plant do i have the ability to first find out whether to know whether the process which they have developed is my process mm-hmm. or you know is it a rip off of my patent or it is completely new process and then even if i find out do i have that ability that whole bandwidth to take them to the court of law on this patent infringement it's a it's a it's a big yeah, thing you know so for a company of my size i think it is too much information too much too much uh, to handle rather what we have decided is once we establish some very sustainable eco friendly cost effective process we set up large capacities try to get as much market share in the first two three years so then if, even if a new entrant wants to enter it is quite difficult for them to get into this business say we see some of my processes have been in the business for 14 odd years till date nobody has been able to replicate or copy mm. it gives me a confidence that whatever we are doing is not so easy or off the rack that somebody can just come up and start that and plus now you know it's been 15 years i have been working a lot of backward forward improvements integration backward integration forward integration a lot has happened so for somebody to do it it's going to take good amount of time good amount of time i can right. say that and so that as you mentioned about market share currently what's our market share in i mean where do we where are we dominant right now so say in mhq we have 50% global market share in bha we would have 30 35% global market share format is also 30 35% so in uh, go i call could be lower 20 25 or percent so all the products we are probably top 3 largest producers in the world and i think that is what we like that whenever we set up something we try to be in top 3 producers globally and have a meaningful capacity so that you know then these volumes of capacities really help us in you know uh, improvements in yield efficiency all our dedicated lines so you know that has its own advantages i feel right and very lastly so that on the sales front as well Uh, how does the sales front work for a company like yours is it a direct sales channel to the companies itself or are there intermediaries in between which are involved so you know it's a b2b business as you can imagine hmm. see business is also so customers are all known to us but sometimes it's customers choice whether they want to directly deal with us or they want to distribute hmm. because these performance chemical let's talk about performance chemical as i told you performance chemical is the smallest item on a purchasing list mm-hmm. but the purchaser does not want to always rely on material getting from india because if this performance chemical does not reach the same on time this entire facility can go can close wow. so in that point they they want that these we have stock points uh, very close or within their country so hence we have stock points all over the globe for our products but then there are customers who prefer to work directly with us because they don't want to get any of these additional cost of local storage or intermediates or distributors like you, as you can call so in that case we also do direct business 
but say for instance india india we are there so you know everybody all businesses happen directly with mm. customers same is with uh, other parts where people have confidence they they also work directly with us so it really depends on customer to customer product to product but it's a mix of both direct as well as distributor channel right all right so that thank you so much for parting this knowledge and i think on the valuation front as well uh, and in terms of performance we've seen that past performance does indicate that you have been better than peers congratulations once again and hoping for a good listing as well let's let's uh, talk soon as to you know how it opens up as well but once again congratulations for this achievement thank you so much hiral thank you so much thank you. thank you speak soon bye have a good day you too bye Subscribe to our YouTube channel for in-depth interviews of India Inc and press the bell icon so that you do not miss our updates.